Hi, peace stats folks. I hope you're having a great day. Um, I'm gonna get going because we have a lot to cover in this chat in this section in this video. Um, so we are gonna cover the chi squared goodness of fit test. And basically, what we're gonna go over today is we're gonna um, be able to check the conditions for this uh, hypothesis test. Um, we're gonna use a chi squared goodness of fit test. Um, to make conclusions about data um, and then just kind of like look at the differences that chi-squared tests have compared to other things that we've done before. Um, okay, so I know we went, kind of went over this in class, hopefully, but um, the chi-squared goodness of fit test um, is basically like if you have um, a distribution of a bunch of different categories, so um, the best example is M&Ms, right? Because in a bag of M&Ms, you have lots of different colors. And so that, say, for example, you have red, yellow, green, blue, M&Ms in a bag. And M, uh, Hershey's claims that um, a certain proportion of each color is in a certain bag in, in the population of all the M&Ms in the world. Um, and you open your bag and you find that you don't have any yellows. Um, and you have more greens than you're expecting and um, only one red, right? And so basically what you want to do is you want to take the data that you're given from a sample and you s want to test whether or not um, the population distribution is correct. Um, and the thing that makes this different from perhaps doing a hypothesis test for um, just the color yellow or just the color green um, is that you might have one color that's off um, and the rest of them are on par of what, you know what the population says but um, what if all of the colors are kind of off and you want to know what's the probability of getting all of those colors at the same time in a sample that's significantly off from the population claim. So um, that's kind of the basic idea of the goodness of fit test. You're basically like asking how good of a fit is my sample to the population. Um, so that's kind of your goodness of fit test. Um, so you can go ahead and write that down if you'd like um, or pause. Um, so how do you calculate chi-squared? Um, so chi-squared is a statistic, right, because you're always calculating it from a sample. And uh, chi-squared is calculated by um, adding up, so I'm going to use big sigma to, you know, represent the sum of your observed minus expected squared all over your expected. And all those observed and expected values, those are not proportions. They are counts. Okay, so make sure you're always using counts for the chi-squared. All right, and so for every different amount of degrees of freedom, um, the chi-squared distribution looks different. So if your degrees of freedom is 1, it looks like this first purple curve, right, which is very, very, very skewed to the right. Um, if you have degrees of freedom four, it's also still pretty skewed to the right, less so than degrees of freedom one. Um, degrees of freedom eight, again, still skewed right, um, but less so. Um, and the important thing to note about the degrees of freedom here is that your degrees of freedom is no longer your sample size minus one for chi-squared. Um, it's actually the number of categories you have. So like, uh, your number of categories minus one. So if you have like five colors of M&Ms, then your degrees of freedom is four, and you'd be on the fourth, on this, on the red curve. Something else that's interesting about the chi-squared distribution is that the mean is actually equal to the number of degrees of freedom. So on your um, curve for eight degrees of freedom, your mean is actually at exactly eight, and your degrees of freedom four is exactly at the mean is at uh, four, okay? So 
what this does is it kind of gives you an idea of when you get a chi-squared value, right, when you get your test statistic, if you have, say, for example, we're doing the color thing with M&Ms, right, and we have five M&M colors, so we have degrees of freedom four, right, um, then our expected chi-squared value would be around four. So if, you know, I got a chi-squared of like, um, you know, 4.2, that's not that unusual. But if I got a chi-squared value of something like, I don't know, 12.1, um, you would say, wow, okay, that's way off, right? Because my degrees of freedom and the mean of my distribution is four. And so I would expect numbers around four for chi-squared. And if you look at that distribution, right, 12 is all the way out here, right? And that shaded region would be our p-value if you got something like 12.1. And so that's going to be a really small p-value, and therefore you would reject the null hypothesis. You would say something like, you know, because of the goodness of fit chi-squared test, I think that the distribution was wrong. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how the goodness of fit test and the chi-squared distribution is very different from um, a lot of the tests that we've done before. Mostly the setup is the same. You state your hypothesis, you check your conditions. Most of the conditions are the same. Um, and then you do your calculation. Calculation's different, but you're still getting a, a test statistic. You're getting um, a p-value and you're getting degrees of freedom, as usual. Um, and then you're concluding, concluding in context. Um, I reject the null hypothesis or I fail to reject the null hypothesis. And this means that blah, 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 blah in context, okay? So what's different is that before this chapter, we've only lived in the normal world, right? We have lived, everything that we've done has been approximately normal, approximately normal, approximately normal, approximately, oh, and then the t-distribution, well, it's not normal, but it's approximately normal. Everything we've been in the normal world. Now we get to the not normal world. This is the skewed world. Okay, we're always skewed right. The chi distribution is always skewed right. Um, it's never going to be skewed left because your extreme values are going to be positive, are going to be higher values because you're always squaring things. You're never going to have a negative value. So anyways, you're living in the normal world, which means when you check your conditions, you still have the independent check, you still have the um, uh, random check, but instead of normal, you're not checking for normality anymore because the chi distribution is not, the chi squared distribution is not normal. Okay, so that would be silly to check the normal distribution for the chi squared test, for the chi squared distribution. So, if we're living in the normal, if we're not living in the normal world anymore, okay, instead of checking for normal, we are now going to check for um, just a large enough sample. And basically that large sample size condition is just that all of your expected counts must be greater than or equal to five. Um, so you just, well, I'll show you what it looks like later in the example. Okay, um, so hypotheses. Now instead of saying P1, um, my proportion is equal to the claim, um, now we have a distribution of um, of proportions. And so you have two options for your hypotheses. One is you can write out um, the distribution of colors that Hershey claims to be true is actually true. The alternative hypothesis is that it's not true. Um, so if you write that out, that's one option. Or you can actually list out the proportions, the actual claims with the numbers in it. That is fine too, as long as you define what those parameters are. Um, where, uh, so yes, you can do that as well. Degrees of freedom we already talked about, number of categories minus one. Okay, so finding the p-value once you've found your chi-squared statistic, you just go to the table and you find your degrees of freedom. So say for example we had degrees of freedom five, so you go over to the degrees of freedom five, which is this yellow, the row that I'm highlighting, and then you look for your chi-squared value. And um, my chi-squared value that I just 
that pulled out of nowhere, pulled out of my butt, um, <laughs> is 10. I just made that up. Um, and so then you try to find your p-value. So then you say, okay, well, 10 is in between 9.24 and 11.07, which means my p-value is in between 0.05 and 0.1. Um, and then you would conclude in context. Um, and then on your calculator, you go to distributions, um, the normal place we usually go, and then you do your chi-squared, your lower bound, upper bound, and then your degrees of freedom. So let's do an example. Little note, um, keep in mind that since chi-squared is always positive and skewed to the right, um, unlike the Z and T tables where it's always shading to the left, um, the chi-squared p-value is shading, is finding the area shading to the right. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you use it, the calculator, it doesn't matter because you'll put your upper bound as positive infinity um, and your lower bound is whatever your chi-squared value is. But, um, you know, just keep that in mind if you're using the table. Okay, so we have the census. The census has um, a certain claim of ages of residents of the U.S. Um, who are 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to um, 60 and older. Um, and then you take a sample that has the following um, counts, okay, um, that's given in the table. And the question is, does the data uh, provide convincing evidence that the age distribution of people who answer landline telephone surveys is not the same as the age distribution of all U.S. residents? So we want to state... Uh, what we're going to do and what our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are. So our state looks something like this. We want to perform a chi-square goodness of fit test of the following hypothesis. The age distribution of people who answered landline telephone surveys is the same as the distribution of all U.S. residents. And then the alternative hypothesis is that it is not the same. Cool. Okay, checking conditions for our plan step. Same, mostly the same as before. Random. Were the, was the sample randomly selected? Yes. Um, independent is our, are our trials independent or um, is n less than or equal to 10% of the population? Okay, so random, independent, we're good on those two. Then we just need to check um, our large sample size. So we have to calculate all of our expected values. Um, so that means we have to go back to our proportions. And we had... Um, 1048 in our sample, so we would expect 19.1%, um, so 0.191 times 1048 to be uh, between 20 and 30, okay? So that's what we're calculating. I'm just going to do it for, you know, time's sake, but I'm just going to um, write those all out for you. So I found all the expected counts, um, and they are all significantly greater than 5. So we can continue with the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Um, and so now we do the do step. We do our calculations. All right, degrees of freedom is the number of categories minus 1. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different categories. So our degrees of freedom is 4. Our chi-squared value is our observed minus expected squared divided by expected. Um, and then adding all of those up. Okay, so I'll do the first one with you. So you have, for the 20-year-olds, you've got your observed, which is 141. That's from your sample. Minus expected, which is 200. Remember, I calculated that up here. Okay. Um, that's something that you're going to have to calculate. And then we square that number and divide by our expected value. Then we add that to... Um, our 30s, right, so 186 minus my 30s expected value, 225.3, divided by 225.3, we square the numerator, and then we keep going. Okay, so that's really how you calculate it. Um, you end up with chi-squared as 48.12, um, and then you're going to have to find your p-value, um, and I do want to show you how to do this on your calculator as well. So I'm going to um, make a second video showing you how to do everything on your calculator. Um, but you have your chi-squared is 48.12. Now remember, you have degrees of freedom 4, which means the mean of the distribution is 4. This is significantly, significantly higher than 4. So our p-value is probably going to be really small. 
Okay, so now we want to find the p-value for um, a chi-squared statistic of 48.12 degrees of freedom 4. Um, and remember, your p-value is the probability of getting um, this, these particular um, values in your sample or anything um, more extreme given that the null hypothesis is true. Right, that the two distributions are exactly are the are the same. Um, so our p-value, we need to go and look at um, a distribution a table of our probabilities for the chi-square distribution. Um, and remember, I have degrees of freedom four. I had five categories, so my degrees of freedom is four. So I need to look for a chi-squared value on this line of like forty eight or for forty. 48. Um, it's not even on the table. It is so extreme. So this is very, very, very unlikely. The probability of this happening is really close to zero. And therefore, we want to reject our null hypothesis. So our conclusion looks something like this. Since our p-value is extremely small, um, and what this means here, this probability, um, this is my p-value. So that's the probability of getting a chi-squared value you know, on a distribution degrees of freedom, 4, um, that is greater than 48.12. Um, that probability is less than 0 0.001, which is um, really small and much smaller than our alpha level, 0 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. Um, there's significant evidence to say that the age distribution of people who answer phone surveys is different than the distribution of all U.S. residents.